Welcome once again to the Faces of Business. I am your host, Damon Pistolka, and I am so excited for our guest today because I have Dave Griffith with us here today, and we're going to be talking about implementing high-impact system improvements. Dave, welcome. Thank you, Damon. Uh, thank you for having me. Hello, everyone. All right. This is awesome, man, because this is near and dear to my heart, to my first love after my family and my friends and the Seahawks. But nonetheless, I do love manufacturing and industrial companies and just some of the cool stuff we get to work on in them. So, Dave, you, you've you got Kaplan Solutions. You're out there helping people implement these, these like we say, these high-impact system improvements. But let's start back a ways. Let's start back to Dave getting out of college and thinking about what he's going to do. Let's talk about your background and how you got here and working on the things you're working on today. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. So uh, I, I I guess maybe if we go even b before college, I, I come from a family. And if I look back, you know, there are lots of there are lots of engineers. There are lots of people who work in in manufacturing and industry. Very and cool. Damon, as, as, as I like to joke with everyone, I did the thing that every young boy attempts to do. And I tried to do something completely different uh, yes. th th than everyone in my family does. Right. So I, I, I tried that. And I like to joke that uh, that manufacturing has, has pulled me back in a couple of important times um, in my career. So on the, the technical side. I thought, I, I guess, I love aviation. I love aerospace. I thought that I wanted to go work on airplanes. And so my, my technical background is I got certified as an airframe and power plant mechanic. I right? that. So, so, the, so the FAA gave me a, a little card about the size of a credit card. We don't want to talk about how expensive it was, but they basically said that I can assumably work on anything that flies. And so I thought that I was going to go do that. And I thought I was going to go find a group that would pay me to, to go finish college. Um, and shortly after finishing, uh, finishing that at, at a great school, I, I basically decided that I didn't want to go bend sheet metal uh, for the rest yeah. of my life. And uh, like th there were, there were opportunities in that, in the kind of mid two thousands, there were very few opportunities kind of beyond that. Uh, so that, that wasn't what I wanted to do. So I ended up uh, going back and, and finishing up a, a business degree, not really a hundred percent sure what I was going to, what I was going to do. And as I was doing that, I had a couple of opportunities. I worked for a, a German OEM, right? So I worked for this, uh, this company that they built machines that uh, basically large gantry machines that drill and rivet airplane fuselages together. Ooh. And yes. And so, so that, that was both a lot of fun and that was an attempt to go find something that wasn't in manufacturing, but was in aviation and aerospace. And yeah. And, and, and shortly into that, it became a, Hey Dave, we'd love for you to help us be a salesperson, but we re what we really need is we need a manufacturing engineer because our only manufacturing engineer is getting ready to go on maternity leave, right? And so I, I spent a lot of time going and working on that side with the Germans. I also spent a bunch of time going and attempting and building a supply chain in the U.S. because I think I was in U.S. employee four, or U.S. employee yeah. five, uh, yeah. so, so, something along those lines, and so. It was one of those opportunities that I got to to leverage both of my loves, and I, I got to do some really interesting and amazing things uh, while doing that. Got to uh, yeah, got, got to leverage a bunch of skills, and and that was a, that was a lot of fun. I, I learned a bunch of things uh, while doing that. A lot of things that were good, and a lot of things that were maybe l less than good. But the the opportunities of working with a small company, a small organization, are fantastic. I got to mm -hmm. go and design what amounted to about a hundred million dollar aircraft facility. Um, and, and very wow. few people, uh, while finishing their degree are able to go, go ahead and say, yeah. Hey, I was given this opportunity. Um, I can still close my eyes sometimes and, and picture as everything moves through, uh, moves through the plant floor. We, we did it all on engineering graph paper. Yeah, as yeah. I, I like to say, Damon, if I were to do it again today, I would do it completely differently, but I don't know, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, you, you don't particularly know better. So, so technology mm -hmm. has certainly improved, has certainly improved uh, since then. And then kind of from that point, I, I continued to drive back into, into manufacturing. I spent some time working for a distributor and manufacturer's rep, uh, selling and leveraging hardware. And at that point in my career, I was like, 
hey, what I would really like to do is I, I'd really like to, to go kind of build these larger solutions, build these data solutions. And so I spent about two and a half years running a systems integration company. And that was our main focus, mostly on MES, so manufacturing execution systems. And man, uh, as we were talking about before we went live, I've got some really good stories of things that went well. And I've got some really good stories of things that didn't go well. And, and if I may just transition into what I'm doing now, a lot of those things that I saw that didn't go well over and over again have led me to to start Kaplan Solutions. And that is what I've been doing for the last three and a half years. And and Damon, some days it, it feels like uh, it feels a little bit longer. Some days it feels like it was just yesterday. Yeah, uh, that was the company. Yeah. Yeah. So so as you so one of the things I always like to ask people is, is when you look back on it, what's the one bit of professional advice somebody got you or gave you when you were getting ready to go out there with Kaplan? What's the best piece of advice someone gave you when you said, I'm going to go do this? So I, I guess, I guess it's the best piece of advice, but also potentially the worst piece of device, depending upon how it goes. But I guess I had a lot of people saying, Hey, Dave, you should go do it, right? Like you should go ahead and take the leap. I, at that point, had been planning to, to go make that transition. My, my wife and I have been planning to go make that transition for the better part of a year. Like, we mm -hmm. knew what it was going to do, but but it's always scary going and starting yeah. your own company, right? Yeah. And and so I, the, the best piece of advice that, that I have heard kind of over and over again is is basically go give it a shot, right? Like, like go give it a shot, see what you can do. Now, I started Kaplan in, in 2019, and we all know what happened in 2020. And everything yeah. that I had planned and thought I was going to do for those first six months and then had built some of a client base up on uh, was not what we are doing today, right? A lot of what we are doing today is delivering these high-impact solutions. So, yeah. so being being nimble and agile has been exceptionally important. Um, and it, it is almost funny how everything continues to come full circle. Mm -hmm. That that's for sure. And like you said, uh, give it a go because yep. you can always go over the other way if you wanted to. Yep. That's that's great advice. And then the other thing that you said, I think that a lot of people, a lot of people get hung up on is they're not nimble enough in their businesses. And, and that's all the way through. I don't, I don't even think you can be in business for 50 years. And I think it's actually a worse problem than if you're in business for five months, Absolutely. just because of the fact that the, the being nimble and listening to what the market really wants or how your skills really play into your customers needs and, and where you can provide the most value is, is critical. Absolutely. So you, you started doing, uh, with Kaplan, you do profit by design. Is that how uh, absolutely? Yes. Yeah. So for, for me, profit by design is kind of, and Damon, I think I've told you the story, right? Profit by design is, is kind of the, at this point, everything that I have learned, right? So I, I learned lots of things over the years, uh, again, some of which went exceptionally well, some of which went exceptionally poorly. And my goal with profit by design is to deliver these, these high impact solutions, with mm -hmm. that, what I've learned is that, you know, some people can come in and say, hey, you can do X, Y and Z things. Um, and, and many times those from an outside party are valuable. But what I found some of the biggest value creations um, th that I've seen over my career are people internal to the company. Right. Like what are the pain points that the organization has mm -hmm. and then understand how how expensive those pain points are. And then can I deliver a solution that's still provides breakthrough, high impact return to, to that organization. And that is the goal with Profit by Design is to go through a bunch, a number of different problems that an organization has and see what is possible to, uh, to deliver and what is possible to deliver quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the high impact improvements like that, I mean, you can come in and get the the first major piece of the changes made to get mm -hmm. a, a lion's share of the improvement benefit and then people can refine over time or adjust absolutely. as they need yeah it's, it's absolutely really cool. if, if i may uh so, so a really good example of this is is last year i was working with a with a brewery co-manufacturer right they're in the 40 to 80 million dollar a year range um and they had we had just implemented some 
uh, some automated tracking, right? And so after one particularly bad week, I was on site. I realized that we had spent about 50 hours of the previous week down. And I'm like, this is really bad because 50 hours is about half of what they, they in theory should have been running. So we were down yeah. about half of the time after going and just kind of asking some questions. I'm like, guys, why were we down? And a good portion of that is because the, the beer and the seltzer, kind of the things ready to go into the can line weren't ready. So kind of going and stepping back to understand why that happened. It's it's because the schedule changed a lot. It's because things weren't signed off. It's because quality wasn't done. And if it's not done during the early stages of, of like first shift or beginning a second shift, we take all of this downtime on third shift and especially on weekends. So we spent about six hours. I walked in un, a, a, an immeasurable number of miles over the six hours trying to get everyone together. We grabbed one of the internal developers and kind of threw up an MVP of can what what would this look like to get some automated sign offs and what would this look like to get some automated sign offs? Um, on Google Docs, what they had currently been using. And and basically over the course of six hours, we rolled out this tool and we saved 30 to 40 hours of downtime the following week from the same problem because we removed the imperfect information that they were having. And, and we did some rough calculations because this was before Profit by Design became, a th became yeah. named as it was. And like rough back of the napkin calculations, it was like four and a half or five million dollars of downtime problem that the organization had. And we should roughly save about four million, four to four and a half million, depending upon how we calculate that, right? We'll capture the top 80 or 90% yeah. of those problems. Yeah. And- I mean, I mean, Damon, I, I can tell people that it cost approximately nothing because we put an iPad up on a wall, used a TV that was already there and captured some internal resources. But but it, it almost sounds insane. But there, there are many organizations that I see that have huge internal problems that just a, a small MVP couldn't go prove out, hey, we can go solve a problem this way. Yeah, there's no doubt in that. And that's it's and it's. Yeah, I did. That's such a great example, though, because you're like 50 hours of downtime in a week and about half the production time that they actually yeah. were scheduled to be up. I mean, you doubled their production almost with what mm -hmm. with that change. And that's that's what uh, is so amazing about some of these things that happen over time. It could be building up over time. It could be built into the systems and the processes already. Well, that's that's the way it is. Yep. And with a fresh set of eyes, we can, we can uncover things that, that really make a huge difference. So as we're, as we're looking at these kind of things, what are the typical situation that you find yourself in? Someone, I mean, you, this is a great example in, in, in bottling beer. I mean, it's a, a, a that's, and people haven't seen it. It's quite a process when you see it happening and see it happening in volume. Um, but uh, what are some of these situations and what are some of the one of the most interesting situations you found yourself in? Let's start uh, there. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. So I guess a, a lot of the situations that, that I talked to, to groups and organizations with are, are kind of, hey, we have a throughput problem, right? Like we need to go make more of we need to go make more of whatever we have be it beer be it cheese be it sausage be it kind of juice anything that you anything that you can make uh typically and especially i see a lot of this in, in food and beverage right because yeah. if we can get it to the shelves most of the time people are going to uh people are going to go purchase uh, yeah. what, what this looks like. So, so lots of times it's a throughput or downtime conversation that leads me into uh, that, that leads me into these. And, and I have seen kind of the entirety of the gambit, right? So I, I sometimes work with, with groups. Um, I've got, I've got a, a great client down in Florida and they have the, this really good core team. And every time I go around, like to introduce people, they're like, hi, I am Dave. I have worked at X company for like 34 years or yeah. I've, wor I've worked here so long that I have stopped counting my years of service. And, and they're a great group, uh, very strong union, right? That they pay very well and the mm -hmm. long time people that they're able to keep. But then on the flip side, like, like this brewery, for example, they, they had been in existence for six years that they had just kind of in, in the mid-level co-packing, they had found this niche 
And they had Damon like two and a half times the orders that they were physically able to throughput every month. Yeah. And so basically the, the longest person of service that wasn't an executive that had a piece of the company was like, um, like two years. Right. Yeah. And in many of these places, two years doesn't get you to, to the filler. Right. And in many places, two years is I'm still carding, you know, cardboard from the back. So I feel like we, we certainly run and, and see the gambit of of different groups and of different people mm -hmm. and the, the amazing part to me is that almost regardless of how good the group is there is almost always room for improvement if we look mm -hmm. at throughput if we look at downtime if we look at kind of any of these measures that are important well yeah i think i think you hit both ends of this the spectrum there really nicely because in the inexperienced time uh situation where people are fairly new you're going to bring a level of experience to the situation that they don't have and a, a various um flavors of the of the experience that helps them come up with better solutions uh and that's one of the things that that i somebody else was telling me about that years ago it's like that's one of the things that an outside resource can really bring to your company is the flavor of many places and many things that they've had to solve outside of your specific situation, mm -hmm. which is really nice. And then with the inex inexperienced workforce, you can level them up fairly quickly if if uh, if you got good people that want to learn, you know, and, and want to do the things. And then on the flip side of that, with the experienced people, sometimes we get a little bit, and I say we because I'm getting a little long in the tooth there too, you know, and sometimes you get, so, hey, this is how we've done it. And I, I know that's not the case of everything, yep. but even even just like, hey, what do you eat? What do you do when you come into work? What's the first thing you do? And, and simple changes in some of these things, even in a highly organized, experienced workforce can make huge improvements. Absolutely. A, a good example of that is I, when I come in, I very rarely am the process expert. Right. And th that's what I tell yeah. groups like I am not the process expert. What I'm really good at doing is, is asking questions. Right. So we, we found that downtime instance at the company uh, where they lost half of production because of imperfect information. Right. And I was just there. I was asking the question. I'm like, guys, how are we down this much? Th this doesn't possibly make any sense. But then on the flip side, I work with some some larger organizations, as I mentioned, that the groups have been there for, you know, 20, 30 years. That was the literal core. And so I was down there working with one of uh, with one of those beverage manufacturers uh, end of end of Q4 last year. And I'm just we're, we're going through and, and we're, we're looking at different opportunities. We're actually deploying what I call a connected workforce tool. And so what, what that is, is if you guys are familiar with like Facebook of like the early 2010s, you can go use your phone, use a tablet, go say, hey, I have a problem here. It gives us the ability to go filter those problems so that we can then solve the problems and store it in a knowledge base. Right. And so so, so we're, we're going through rolling out that and they've got this really interesting tool that allows us to take documents and videos and pictures and put them into QR codes and put those QR codes where people need them on the machines. So oh. we, so Damon, it's one of my, my most fun stories from the end of last year. So, so we're, I'm going out to lunch with, with all of these guys, um, like, like all of the, the maintenance managers and things like that. And I'm like, Hey guys, like, what are your problems? Like you guys seem to have a, a really good core group. How can I help you do your job? And, and we had this offhanded comment of, hey, what would be really nice is to take our electrical drawings because all our electrical drawings are either printed in a stack somewhere on the floor or they're in a or they're, they're in a document control version that the last time I looked, Damon, four people knew how to use it. And two and a half of them have retired or, or left at this point. So basically one person knows how to use it. And so the pain point is it takes 20 to 60 minutes every time we have to go find one of these drawings. And I'm like, wait, so if we were to take these drawings to key machines, put them on the machines and we get you guys to scan them and immediately pop it up, it would save us, I don't know, hours every week. And the answer turned into yes. And that it's a $10 million opportunity, right? We're going to conservatively save two to 5% of the downtime by just giving them the tools at the place that they need it. And it, it, it's a huge opportunity. 
And it, this is just leveraging technology. And what I have found is if I can get those people who have been there for 20 or 30 years to want to use the tools, I'm going to be able to capture the knowledge and we're going to be able to help the younger force, the younger workforce that is coming behind them. So when I go in, I look to, to win over the people who have been there the, the longest, right? Like we, we were mm -hmm. like, hey, we really need these three people. Like if Damon is the old guy and Damon's like, no, I don't want to change. It becomes, hey, Damon, what is your pain point? How can we help you? And how can we leverage whatever these tools that we're looking to use into going to, to help what you're doing? And not 100% of the time, but a, a very high percentage of the time, 90, 95% of the time, we're able to, to turn some of those people around into our internal project champions. If we can turn those people into internal project champions, literally the, the sky is the limit. They are not yeah. going to let the project fail. And if they're not going to let the project fail, they're not going to let anyone screw up the project and the thing that they want to do. And more often than not, if we can relate the pain points that the elder statesmen, the people that have been there the longest are having and solve those problems, we are going to do tremendous impact to the business at large. Yeah, that's pretty crazy because you're right. If you can get the get the right uh, champions for getting things done uh, on board with you, you're going to it's just your projects are going to get done and they're going to help make sure that everyone else understands and is just say if you set up some kind of procedure that or a way to do something, they're going to make sure that it's followed. It's going to, Absolutely. because otherwise that's, a, you know, one of the things that I've seen many times is you can have great ideas, but if they're not executed the way they're supposed to, it's, it, it's sitting on a shelf as a great idea. Absolutely. I think I promised you a horror story or horror stories, Damon. Yeah. We got to get have, one of those in there. Cause that, that's right, always right. fun. Absolutely. So one of the one of the, the core reasons that I started Kaplan that has turned into what we're doing with Profit by Design, I think I said I did a lot of MES, manufacturing execution system yep. work. And and I would like to, to be very clear to say that I wasn't part of this in the beginning. If I was, I wouldn't have allowed this to happen. But but it's the story kind of as old as time. Right. So, so someone at the end user goes and builds this list of requirements in a vacuum on a whiteboard and yeah. then. They say, hey, this is what we have to do. So the, the, it goes out to bid and a company that I worked with uh, for, for a while went and bid it. And originally the, the project was supposed to be, I don't know, $200,000 and it was supposed to be done in, I don't know, like three to six months. And it turned mm -hmm. into two and a half million dollars in three years. And then they go try to launch this behemoth um, at, at, the, at this end user and and Damon, this is this is one of my my like it's the most poetic thing. For whatever reason, the entire system was leveraged on the fact that we're going to schedule in this system. Now, mind you, we apparently had never talked to the scheduler to understand how they schedule things. So, go day day one of when we're supposed to launch this thing. Go to the scheduler. Say, hey, we're going to go schedule in this for for now, and. To my understanding, they basically said no, right? They're like, no, we're not going to schedule in this. And, and in the, the most poetic of things, that's where the project died, right? Like the plant manager wasn't, no one was willing to tell the scheduler they had to schedule in this system. And literally two and a half million dollars in three years of project, poof, gone. The internal project manager got fired. And as I've said before, very much deserved to get fired for a bunch of reasons, but it, it is one of those, like, we could have just asked a couple of questions. We could have solved people's problems. And instead of getting in a fight yeah. as to the things that need to be done or not done, we could have turned this into a, a hugely impactful solution. And honestly, we should have rolled it out in phases for a variety of reasons, mm -hmm. including there were three years of lost opportunity over the course of this project that just continued to balloon up and up and up. Yes, yes. Well, wow, that's a, that's a great, great example of a system implementation gone bad from the beginning. Because mm -hmm. that, oh, you know, over the years I've been involved in a number of them, not huge ones, but even the ones that I've been involved in, you can be in a a fifteen twenty million dollar company and end up spending a million dollars on a on a system type Im implementation if you're not careful. And, Absolutely. and then, and then, like you said, you get to the end and you go, who the heck decided that we needed this? Yep. Absolutely. 
I, and, I see lots of, I was going to say, I see lots of, of projects and programs that yeah. like you consider going and piloting something, right? And, and there's no success metrics at the end of it. So, so we get to the end of this thing and people are like, well, it didn't do what we expected it to do, but you don't have requirements or specifications at the beginning to determine what is success, what will be, what would make a success versus what would make a failure. And, and I see it time and time again. And, and looking at it from the business side, like it doesn't make any sense, but having lived yeah. on the implementation side, most requirements that you see don't have business cases, right? Maybe at best you get some functional requirements. And I've seen it everything from small single million uh, dollar companies to mm -hmm. multi-billion dollar companies that I go in and I'm like, how did you guys get yourself in this position? This is like, literally we should scrap every, like if we didn't have $200 million of equipment and, and integration done, we should have literally scrapped everything and started over from scratch. But, but here you are. So before startup, we have to kind of band-aid it together so that hopefully we can run production so that hopefully five years from now, we can actually go fix things that should have been solved to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. That's awesome. That's awesome that there are problems like that to solve because it, it, it pushes us and drives us to, to really think about things differently. Um, yeah. It's just in when, when we get in, you know, thinking about the perfect or the theoretical where we want to go, it often mm -hmm. outpaces where we really should be going. And I think it, it gets a lot of people hung up, especially when you're putting systems in and you're thinking about, um, it, I don't know. I just saw this again the other day. That's why it's relevant to me is that a, a you talk about MES system or you talk ERP or just any of these systems that are underlying be, across the business like they are. And, and you go, well, it's really cool that you handle scheduling this way, but can you make it do this? Yep. Or, or, you know, we don't really invoice like that. Uh, our process is different. Can you follow our process? Mm -hmm. And people don't understand what that does. And, and you, and ERP or MES system, people that have mm -hmm. done it before, or people that have lived through it after the fact and tried to go back and upgrade to another version of software or something like that. I think a lot of people get caught in up in the fact that if we are going to use one of these systems, we need to see how our processes fit within the framework of the systems and then use what the system has first and foremost. And only if we come to an impasse that we can't work around easily do we ask for custom programming that's going to be something that in a later version is going to be a problem or mm -hmm. you know because i mean in small companies i've seen where you go okay that's going to be we, we'd like to upgrade to the next version of our erp system like, well yeah it's going to be this the upgrade's cool but it's going to be 100k to get the uh, the all the custom programming done that you did you know five years ago when you put this thing in to make it keep working like it is and mm -hmm. not to mention that it's like then you lose all of the it's just there's so many of these systems that everyone is glad especially the bigger systems you, you talk to some of them that are that are owned by some of the companies that that probably own some of the platforms we're on right now. They've got some mm -hmm. systems that they've got a bazillion people that will customize it to no end. And and you get to deal with that for the rest of time. That's my my long winded answer of a of a, of a poignant problem, I think, in these systems. So how many times do you run into that when you just go one of our biggest things we could do to it's just strip junk away. Absolutely. I, I guess, I guess a, a lot of the time. Right. And, and I don't think it's, it's necessarily ever intentional that we stamp no, a whole bunch of softwares not. on there, but so much of the time, uh, I guess, I guess I have a client who loves the football analogies, right? Like he loves blocking and tackling. And I feel like when, when we get to conversations like this, I, I have to, to use Mark's phrase of, Hey, we just need to go back to blocking and tackling because so many of the problems that I see are the basic problems, right? It's not, Hey, we need to go customize this in our ERP or our MES. It's a, uh, 
hey, we really need some standard operating procedures. If we have standard operating procedures, then we could judge people against, do they do the things that we tell them to do? And then we could go enforce these things and continue to move on. But no, very often we go through this process. And I would say maybe two or three times a month, I have conversations with either clients or potential clients. And it's like, hey, we've got this old system. We think that we're going to go to this new system or we've got this old system. And for whatever reason, the company is saying it's going to cost three, four, five hundred thousand dollars just to upgrade to the new version. Like, does it make sense? And I'm like, guys, for for three to five hundred thousand dollars, we could build you something brand new that is one going to cost less. Two will never cost half a million dollars in supporter upgrade fees. And three, we can go reimagine what you're doing to either fit your processes or fit what you want to do in the future. And I think that that is the big thing when you go to look at impactful solutions Mm -hmm. or you go to look to to strip away and redo some systems, really like don't take us, don't take the, the half step back and say, okay, I want this exact same thing to look exactly like it does. I like to ask clients, you know, where do you see yourself in five years? Where do you guys want to be in 10 years? Let us build the structure so that we can help get you there so that two years from now, you don't call me up and say, hey, Dave, I decided to go add a couple more lines or, hey, Dave, we decided to go add this tool. Can we leverage a tool like this into what we're doing? And I'm like, well, no, guys, because three years ago, we made the decision that we were never going to go down this path. Or three years ago, we never talked about it because we didn't talk about it. It wasn't designed in. And so we've got to redo 50 percent of what we did in order to get there. So a lot of the times it's it's not just pain points. It's like, where do you guys want to go into the future? And, And let me help you build that vision, be it a roadmap or whatever it is, so that you can get to that point. That is some of, of my favorite style of work that, that I do with end users, right? Is, yeah. is one, not only how can it be impactful, but two, how can we do the best job to, to future-proof ourselves for the next five to 10 years to make sure that we don't have to go spend two or three times the money to rebuild yeah. things that we have done in the past? Yeah, you make some really good points. And we have... A- uh, Martin doctor on here is talking about low code. And when I saw that, I was like, yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that are happening now. When you talk about systems and you talk about, um, the fact that people might want to just upgrade, but there are come so many different solutions that technology is, as provided for us now, really that, that are alternatives to just, Hey, let's continue on our upgrade path. We're on version 10. It's time to go to 11 or 12 or 15. It might be to go, no, we need to go to this because it's a whole new way of imagining how we're doing this and it's going to be able to take us forward. Absolutely. I I would say that that I've seen a bunch of low code uh, and no code solutions. I think that they're really exciting into the future. I guess I would say that that if you guys are are an end user considering, hey, could I just go buy this low code platform and already give it to the, the folks that already exist and they can go imagine this thing? I have seen it work in varying degrees of absolutely yeah. no success to some success, but you only got 20 or 30 percent of the way there. Uh, so I, uh, I and as I told Damon, uh, names will be changed to protect the not innocent. Right. Yeah. But, but I, I have I've got a friend who works for a large medical device company um, and they were looking at systems. Right. I think they were looking at, at OEE overall equipment effectiveness. So, so basically yeah. just kind of uptime versus downtime versus quality. Uh, tracking. And with that, they considered going a bespoke or custom solution to what they're doing, but they opted for a low code platform. And they found three people from different areas of three different factories and gave them this tool. And it took them like six months. And each of them put up a a little kind of production uh, thing, like like they they built a solution. And, and, And Damon, these guys are telling me, Dave, you know, we found 2% or 5% or, or something like that improvement. And, and I'm like, guys, if you had paid someone to come in and, and do this and then help you execute on it, you're probably at 30 or 40%, right? Yeah. Like t- typically 30, 40, 50, 200% are, are w- what I am seeing. But, and, and you, you do that quickly, right? You do that yeah. by three months, you should be 200 plus 200%. 
as opposed to going and leveraging internal talent because you're, that's always a, a constraint, right? Yeah. No one at, at companies nowadays has a, a free, you yes. know, 20 to 60 hours a week in yeah. order to go build things. So I love low code solutions. I think that they're really good. I think that they're going to help professionals leverage what you're trying to do both quicker and less expensive than going the bespoke path. Yes, I agree. I think some of it's pretty neat stuff that's happening. And I think in the right hands with the right now, this is something that, you know, me with enough as much gray hair as I have, there used to be a day when, when, when people said, well, we, you know, we're going to do that. We're going to do it internally like that because we always did. But realistically, you hit one point here that we should really think about. And I hope people listening think about this. There aren't people in your company that have the time to pick it up, learn it and effectively implement it and then support it long term like you can by having an outside place that does it every day. Come in and do it faster you get what you want, you know, more, more than likely a little bit better because of the experience they bring to it. So quicker time to solution because time to solution is so key in these things. And then the long-term support is much easier to get because you can have them come in. It's not, Oh, Dave's busy. So he can't work on it for the next week or Dave's on vacation for the next two weeks. What are we going to do? You know, those are the kind of things that you deal with when you're trying to use internal people on some of these things that are that are more specialized. And I think that's really where we have to step back. And like you're talking about, when we're implementing these high uh, high impact system improvements in in the day, it was it was lean, lean manufacturing. You know, we everybody used to hate to pay for the consultants to come in to teach to do the lean events. Right. Yep. And. But what you realize is because they have the outside perspective, they're not trying mm -hmm. to do this and getting the calls from the executives or, or them being an executive trying to do it and, and all the distractions that, that come forth. They're focusing the people together and getting these improvements done. And then we, we, we execute and move on. Everyone moves on and, until the next time we're doing it. And, it's just one of these things that we have to use. I think the outside resources allow us to be more profitable, faster and more and better. Absolutely. And then, then I, I would add to that, I guess, two things. One, whenever I talk to, to large companies and it's typically the, the company, I guess I see internal development done two ways, right? New companies who are leveraging low code, no code, yeah. who are leveraging Google Docs or Teams or things like that. And I, I think that those are great kind of beginning tools. But then I also see kind of large legacy Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies who 20, 30 years ago started building these things because they didn't exist and they yeah. knew that they needed them. I have helped and worked with a number of those kind of transition away because what basically amounts to tech debt, Damon, and I think that that's a lot of what you said, right? At some point, we have to decide, are we a software development company that is going to continue to be in this, this terrible tech debt and development? Or do we want to pay like 10 or $15 per user per month in order to leverage the newest, greatest, latest? And if something is an issue, we just go back to our service level agreement and say, yeah. you guys promise 99.999% uptime. Yes. We're down. You guys owe us something back because we're down, right? So I think that I see lots of transition that way because we have lost a lot of that internal talent. And many of the times what we are developing today is two decades behind because we started developing it 20 years ago. It's just behind the tools that we should be using today. Mm -hmm. So I, I absolutely agree with that. And kind of from, from the outside perspective, I think that that's very important, right? Yeah. And doing things the way we do them is is one of the most frustrating things that we say, especially in manufacturing and industry. So a really good example of kind of that, that outside perspective um, is a couple of years ago, right? So I was working with a, a tool and die manufacturer, or I guess a tool manufacturer, right? And so they had a problem 
then and the, the problem was well they had a, a lot of problems which is why they call me that's typically when people call me damon right yeah but, but but kind of at the core is they had this machine that was a constraint and so you go look at the machine and it had three different sections right it had a heat treat section on a belt furnace that dumped into a quench that got picked up and robot robotic arms slowest robots i've ever seen picked it up and, and kind of did the uh, and hardened the teeth of of the tool and so, so you go kind of at the beginning and you're walking through and this this is the constraint for the entire organization. Yeah. If they put more tools, they would sell more tools. So yeah. you go, you look and they're only putting like they're only filling like 60 percent of the belt. And we're like, guys, why are you only filling 60 percent of the belt? And it's like, oh, it's because it's how we've always done it. You know, when I came in five years ago, they said we could only fill it this much. And we're like, well. Let's try to fill it 100% of the way. And Damon, fill it 100% of the way, and we find 40%, plus 40% throughput for the facility. But but it gets better, right? Because for some of the tools, they're double stacking these things. And we're like, why aren't we double stacking all of these in heat treat if this is the issue? And they're like, oh, well, we would have to replace this fairly insignificant uh, motor in order to, to be able to uh, pull more weight of these tools through. So changed out the motor. It was like $5,000 worth of upgrade and, and motor and drive. And so suddenly we are quite literally throughputting 140% oh of my the facility of what we came in. And one of the most painful things is I think we were only about halfway done because it's still such a slow machine. I think we could have, uh, I think we could have found another, I don't know, 40, 50, 120% of improvement with there. But, but it's one of those things that, you have to have that outside perspective. And, mm -hmm. and my job that I find is, is to ask questions, right? And I ask lots of stupid questions. And that's what I tell people. I'm like, guys, this might be a stupid question, but I feel compelled to ask this question because I don't understand. And your process, and, and Damon, internally, I'm thinking, I generally know the answer to these, but mm -hmm. like your process might be so different that you guys have to do something specific and very infrequently is the process so specific that, that we have to do something different. Uh, another, another example of that is I do a lot of heat treat work, right? And I don't think about it until I, I come up with these stories, but I was doing a small system upgrade at a, at a fairly decent sized facility, uh, go going, standing there, the operator of this box furnish pressed the same 17 buttons every time, 10 times a day. And it's like, why are you pressing all these buttons every time? Because they're exactly the same. And it turns out because that's how the that's how the HMI was built. He had to press the same 17 buttons every time. And what, what amounts to, I don't know, half a day, we go make sure that they're always the same button, make sure that there's no reason that he's got to go press these buttons, take 17 buttons, put it in one button that he just presses that is scans in the lot, presses the button, and we find an extra an extra heat treat load every single day. So we went from 10 loads a day to 11 loads a day in uh, less than an hour of development work and half a day of, of running around trying to make sure we could do it, right? To, to that organization, it was worth a million dollars or more. Yeah. Because, uh, and so th th there are lots of things that we've done this way because we've always done it that way. And there are lots of huge improvements and many times huge improvements for relatively low dollar values yes. for organizations. You just have to, someone has to be there to ask the question and it is easier to have to, to pay the, the Dave, to pay the facilitator to go in and ask these questions. And, and I'm happy to go jump on the sword if, if there's, if, if they are silly questions, then it is to, to have the people kind of internally speak up like, why do we do it that way? I couldn't possibly ask because that's how I was trained. I'd look like a fool if I asked someone why we do yeah. it this way. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point because the questions is where the, the gold are, is where you find the gold. And and uh, it's a great example. And I think you, you said one thing in this that is is really incredible. And I think people need to to, to really take this to heart in, in these in industrial situations or situations where you're processing a lot and there, there are bottleneck kind of situations or, or those that these are not necessarily multi-million dollar changes to get these kind of throughput change, the, the throughput increases. And, and uh, that was one of the questions. So when you're in there working on this, do people have a fear that there's just really not anything you can do and it's going to cost a ton of money from the onset? And that's what prevents them from doing, 
to doing more of this, you think, or, or what do you really think is the apprehension? So I think it's that people don't consider it, right? So his, okay. historically, if capital has been cheap and and human labor has been cheap and we've got the space, like historically, people just go buy more lines as opposed to trying to optimize the, the lines yeah. that they have. It's not until capital is expensive and we've run out of space and we can't get more hands that we go to look at these. And and honestly, Damon, I think it's just that there are very few people who look at things the, the way that I look at it. You know, the business is a system. And th there are important levers that one needs to pull to increase the throughput, right? Like one has to find the constraint, the thing slowing down the entire line or the entire facility before you pull the correct lever. Mm -hmm. Because, like, like I could go, may I could go optimize ninety five percent of the systems in an organization, but if none of them are the constraint, then we're still going to throughput the exact same thing. So I think that yeah. there's just very few people who have that system thinking. And there are very few people that, that just go ask those questions. I don't particularly have a good answer why. Uh, so there are very few people that ask those questions. And many times when people come in are like, hey, we've got to optimize this. Again, we've got a scope of work or something else that mm -hmm. just doesn't make sense. It doesn't hit the business need. So if we take half a step back, say, hey, let's go see if there's a better way to do this or let's go get some of that outside perspective because yeah. everyone has been here for 20 or 30 years. We only know the things that we know. Let's go bring someone else in for a relatively inexpensive number of dollars. Let's see if we can do stuff with the people we have. And, and many times when, when I come in and I ask these questions, we're helping to increase throughput or increase profit. And when we're doing that, we're making the the lives of the people who are doing the jobs better because we're solving pain points they have. So, so we're removing mm -hmm. some of the, the worst tasks that people have and allowing them to upskill and uptrain into less repetitive manual tasks. And I think that that's where we see and we'll continue to see big wins. And if I may, there are many organizations that have managed to get by just by kind of sheer momentum. I think that if organizations, and it doesn't have to be with me, but if organizations don't take a step back and look at their process, you know, with the cost of capital continuing to rise, with inflation continuing to rise, and we've got pressures on, on all sides. And workforce. Are organ yep, and absolutely. Workforce. And, and, and the, the workforce, we, we've got all of these issues. Like if we don't take a hard look at what we're doing, there will be companies that just cease to either exist or cease to have any idea of how they actually make things because yeah. everyone will have retired. Yeah, no doubt. Well, and you, you make so many good cases throughout the conversation here today. Company, a lot of companies are in the situation. If we could make more, we could sell more. That was yep. one you said, if make more, sell more. I'm like, oh my goodness, there will be a all out focus. If I was in there, if you make more and sell more, because mm -hmm. that's usually the, a harder thing to do is to sell Absolutely. it all. Yes. And, and then you talk about future proofing and, and really looking at these simple things that can, that can take us a long ways forward and, and continuously working on that as you get going with it. So awesome stuff, Dave, what you got coming up. That's going to be where people can talk to you. What's the best. Well, first of all, yes. What do you got coming up in the near future where people can talk to you or, or listen to you? A absolutely. So, uh, so, so I, I have a fairly busy next couple of months. Uh, first and foremost, I, I host a show or I co-host a show called Manufacturing Hub, where we talk every Wednesday at four o'clock East Coast time on LinkedIn and YouTube and, and most other platforms uh, where we talk kind of all about manufacturing. We're slightly different. We absolutely get into some technical conversations nice. and we have uh, we have every month we pick a different theme. So we pick a different topic and we have four conversations around that. And so some, sometimes we get super technical. Sometimes we get more into business cases, but it's our goal to kind of put good information out there. This month, we're talking all about data-driven sustainability. So how to leverage data to, to save energy, to save money, to do all of those things. So every Very Wednesday cool. at four o'clock, you guys can check that out. If you're looking for more information, check out Manufacturing Hub dot live is the website uh, that we have and go ahead and follow me on LinkedIn. We, we stream on my LinkedIn profile. 
Beyond that, I'm going to be at a couple of trade shows. Uh, so if anyone is at Hanover uh, Messy uh, in the middle of April, April 17th through the 22nd, over in Hanover, Germany, uh, it's, it's my first time going. I'm super excited to be there. I will be there all five days. I'm doing shows. I'm doing some interviews. I'm doing some live builds. It should be exciting. And then beyond that, I will be at Automate, which is May, the week of May 22nd up in Detroit. So I would imagine most people um, are in are in North America here. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Detroit is generally much easier to get to than Hanover, Germany, which fun fact, Damon, is exceptionally hard to get to from basically anywhere. <laughs> Yes. Well, that's awesome, man. So people can see you on the Manufacturing Hub at 4 p.m. Yeah. Eastern time on your LinkedIn profile and watch that live, or they can go to manufacturinghub.live and catch yes. you there. And if you haven't already, connect with Dave Griffith on LinkedIn, and uh, you can follow him there and find this information. Dave, thanks so much for talking with us today. Absolutely, Damon. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for listening. If anyone has any questions, more than happy to uh, connect and have conversations with you guys. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks, everyone, for being here. We are going to take a little break with the Faces of Business. I've actually got uh, some time with family for the next couple, three weeks that we're going to be having some fun. And uh, or no, maybe. I don't know. I think it's just like one week and then a big back, but, it, but the schedule will be out there, but thanks so much for joining with us. And we'll be back again with more interesting guests. Have a great day, everyone.